Now, if we take a look at drag, we can look at drag as uh, some different types here. We have parasitic drag. Parasitic drag is form drag, skin friction drag, and interference drag. We'll talk about those. And then you also have this thing called induced drag, which happens by actually flying. So we're going to get into these in a little bit. Um, coefficient of drag is CD, and the object's shape will affect this drag. So if you have flow going this way, you're going to have a coefficient of drag that's pretty high on a flat plate, a 1.28, relative to other things. So that number probably doesn't mean anything to you, but if you compare that to a sphere or a bullet or an airfoil, you can see that the drag is significantly less with an airfoil. Now note, all of these objects have the same frontal area. So they're scaled down a little bit. I know this airfoil looks quite a bit smaller, but the frontal area of this is supposed to be the same as the frontal area of the prism and bullet and sphere and flat plate. Um, that's, why, that's what we have as a uniform frontal area. So we can do this comparison, but even still, the coefficient of drag for the airfoil is way, way, way less than the front plate, uh, the flat plate, a lot less. That's why wings have this particular type of shape and not bullet shape or sphere shape or things like that. First one we're going to look at is form drag, which results from a turbulent wake behind the object. So please add that to your engineering notes. Form drag is the turbulent wake behind the object. And you can see some examples here. This is your flat plate. This dark blue region represents turbulence. It's not part of the object. It's just turbulence here. We have less turbulence with the sphere and we have very little turbulence on this flow of this airfoil. Uh, so that is much, much less form drag. Skin friction drag is caused by the roughness of the surface. So a wing surface is designed to be very smooth. In the late 20s, they decided to put flush rivets instead of bolts that had little bolt heads sticking out of the wing. And what that does is it makes a really smooth wing surface that you can attach parts um, to each other. So that really, really improved the flat, smooth surface of wings uh, that was done in somewhere around the late 20s. Uh, I believe it was 1926 and then really first used in 1929. And so because of that, then we reduce skin friction drag. So then our boundary layer where we have this slower air moving is less. And here we have this turbulent boundary area. This would be if you had these little bumps sticking up on the wing um, that added extra turbulence, like little bolts and things like that. Then you also have this thing called interference drag, and that's just the result of varied air currents interacting over the wing. So if you have, you know, some imperfections along the wing, you can get air currents that are sort of deflected, and that can cause interference drag. So make a note of that third one right there. And this is uh, showing in a typical wing, you might have a normal turbulent transition point right around halfway, but because of you, because of these imperfections, uh, these areas that are not cleaned and smoothed out, then your air currents get a little bit more turbulent and then you lose a little bit of lift and it's a little bit less efficient for the aircraft. Induced drag is drag created by the change in pressure from the upper and lower surface of the wing. So anytime you are flying, you have induced drag. You cannot get away from it. So total drag is determined by adding these two. There is an optimum speed to minimize drag and induced drag as you are traveling faster and faster and faster, that induced drag um, drops, but your parasitic drag increases. So there is a optimal speed that gives you a optimal lift to drag ratio. And that may be the um, cruising speed that you want. It might not be, but it's just to note that, that that is a value that exists and it's a value that engineers can sort of play around with to try to make more efficient. So we do have an equation for drag. Yay! It's determined experimentally and it combines a bunch of several factors. So we do the same thing with our wind tunnel to determine what the coefficient of drag is. Depends on the shape, the angle of attack, and this is the equation. You'll note it looks very similar to the coefficient of lift equation because it's exactly the same. Where d is lift in the coefficient of lift equation, it's d in the coefficient of drag equation. All of these other values are the same. So in your spreadsheet, if you've already created one of these, <laughs> yeah, you could just copy and paste that whole table and just change the l to a d for drag and coefficient of drag. So if we have the same Cessna from 172 from that activity in step two, it takes off under the same conditions, how much drag is produced? So if we calculate this out, we have a CD equals 2D over A rho V squared, but we want to calculate drag. So this is where, and I know you don't have the values probably for that previous one. Uh, this is where you may need to rearrange the equation. If you take and try to solve for D by itself, you need to get rid of a divide by a rho v squared. So how do you get rid of a divide by that? You multiply both sides by a rho v squared. So that means this goes over to this left side over here. 
So now we have CD A row V squared. That's why we have that right here. And to get rid of a 2D, to get rid of the 2 in front of the D, we have to divide by 2 because these are being multiplied. We do the opposite. So if we divide that by 2, that's why this whole side now is divide by 2. So we have to solve for D. So I do have a lot of students that will recreate a new equation that solves for D, that solves for A, that solves for velocity, that solves for air density. Once you've done some of those things, um, it does get pretty quick to recreate those equations. And then no matter what information I give you, you can plug the values in and solve for them. If you don't recreate it, then you're going to have to just do these by hand, which you are more than welcome to do. If you want help figuring out how to recreate these equations, please bring me over and I will help you. So if we sub these values in, the coefficient of drag is 0.05. The area is 18.2. You can put these in your calculator if you've recreated this. The air density, the velocity divided by 2, and you would get an answer of 436 newtons for drag. So you also have this thing called downwash down and wingtip vortices, and that's because of a pressure difference at the wingtips. Uh, the air is typically will spill over the wingtip perpendicular to the main airflow, and um, so you have this little vortex that decreases lift. So we, we watched a little video about that, um, and there's a lot of different wing designs that engineers are creating to try to um, compensate for some of these wingtip vortices and so you're going to see a lot of different options here but it can create this vortex line if you've ever flown in an airplane and looked out the window and it's very humid you can see this condensation that forms right off the wingtips and that is that wing vortice right there so um, this is a little fun illustration that shows that as this plane is flying through this, you're getting these little circular uh, vortices along the edges of the clouds. They can flow um, upward and rearward, forming this vortex. And these winglets um, then are things that try to limit these vortices. Um, and I like this plane because it looks like a narwhal. Okay, that is it for coefficient of lift and coefficient of drag. Now you're going to have a few problems that you need to work on your own, and some of them are going to have you have to solve for various different parts of those equations. So that's why you may want to have lots of different solution um, options in your spreadsheet calculator. So continue to work on that spreadsheet calculator, and then you can get to the assignment.